Okay. We are up and motoring. It, we cannot control the fan, but fingers across the last two times, it's miraculously shut off. So we're going to pray. But your husband knows how to fix it with a snap of a finger. Get him in. Well, look at this. Someone is about to there. <laughs> but, go off. Yeah. And watch it go like halfway through. I'm crazy. And it'll be awesome. Okay, I will be right back. That's all right. a long week. Yeah. Yeah, and the fan just shut off. Just like yeah. See, I'm not even lying. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Did you get them done at the same time or separately? Uh, no, I oh. oh, yeah. Okay. You better go now. Oh, yeah. I have an aunt who convinced them to do them both at the same time. We were like, you're insane. <laughs> yeah. No, it was right before, it was at the beginning of COVID. Yeah, so not that long ago. No. Oh, oh. <laughs> no. Oh, I, I can only imagine. Oh, we have seven more minutes and then we would start. It's all set up already. We're on Zoom right now. Okay. Yeah. But and you can't see who's still coming. No, not right now. It looks like it's only me and Shina Garch at yeah. the moment. Yeah. But let me see. Hmm. I might be able, hang on. I might have lied to you. I might be able to do it. 
You might be able. I don't know. I never heard of it. You're already into this. I know nothing about it. Yeah. Oh. I never heard. Yeah, that's his name. Uh, what a shame. Hi, Norris. Hi, or or Karen, yeah, or Steve, whatever you think. We're practicing with the Zoom camera here, just getting it set up for. It's Zooming to. They have advertised it for Zoom. And uh, it will be recorded and then broadcast on the library Facebook page. That's the intent. Yeah, yeah it will be put once it's on YouTube. I will share the link on our social media and on the website. And then you can click the link and view it afterwards. What about uh, those lights there? There isn't one of them. Are they all gone? They don't do much. No. But I have seen them on. Great. How was the ski the other day? Good. Right? Good, good. John Fowler, yeah, no light. No, no sir. No. John, you can sit in the comfy chair there if you want oh, to. Yeah, okay. Never. <laughs> okay. The comfiest and never be Oh, yeah, I've been here, I think, eight years now, something like that. And then I was here before for like four years, so... Hi, Anya.
Can I see other participants? I think they will pop up when okay. they join. Yeah, yeah. Or when they turn on their camera. Right. Yeah. Okay, so everybody on Zoom, we're just gonna go over some housekeeping here for those of folks on Zoom. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you are on Zoom, please keep your mic muted. If you do have a question for Edwin, type it in the chat. And then after his presentation, we will read all the questions and answer them. If you would like, you can turn on your video so that Edwin can see who's listening. But if not, that is okay as well. Um, if you do get kicked off for any reason, just come back on, try to join again, and we'll let you in. But besides that, I will start our, pre our presentation. So welcome to all those online and here in the library. I appreciate you coming out for our third speaker of the 2024 Winter Speaker Series. It's been a great series so far. We are very excited to have Edwin with us tonight. Before we get started, I will just do a land acknowledgement. And then you're not here to listen to me. So I'll leave and leave it to Edwin, whom you're all very excited to hear talk, I'm sure. So, Pincher Creek Municipal Library is located on the lands of the Blackfoot people and pays respect to the Blackfoot people, past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. This land is also home to the Mady Nation of Alberta Region 3. And without further ado, I'll leave you all in the very capable hands of <laughs> Edwin Knox. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Jump into the other chair. <clears throat> well, thanks for coming out tonight. And we've got about a dozen here in the Burt Regal corner of the library. And at least a few people on Zoom, I don't know how, is all I can see is one other screen, and that's my first cousin from Toronto. <laughs> and that's wonderful. And his wife, Beth, and they're waving at me. And um, it's uh, tomorrow and 2.30 in the afternoon in New Zealand. And it's possible, although I can't see them here on, on Zoom, that my niece is watching it from New Zealand. Um. Here we are in the Municipal Library in Pincher Creek, and above my head, about four feet away, it sounds like a real strong Chinook wind blowing through the cottonwood trees. <laughs> but we will ignore that and we'll just charge on into this one hour presentation about um, a great um, passion of mine is the mountain trail and the mountain poems. It all started uh, back at Skokie Ski Lodge in 1981, when I discovered this book of poetry called Timberline Tales, Folklore and Verse of the Canadian Rockies. And if my niece in New Zealand is, is listening, it was her mom, my sister, who's there with her right now, who introduced me to Skokie Ski Lodge first in 1977, the first year I was in the Rocky Mountains out from Prince Edward Island. But 1977, I visited Skokie. 1981, I started working there for four years. And in the small library at Skokie was this awesome little book, Folklore and Verse of the Canadian Rockies by Jimmy Deegan from Banff. <clears throat> so um, I will, I'll read my notes because I'm just going to go through it. It's a little distracting. New venue for me. Usually we're sitting around a campfire reciting these poems or at the fireplace at Skokie Ski Lodge. And I was there for four years um, in the legendary lodge as chore boy and making the ski guests stay comfortable. And with Jimmy's poems, eventually realizing, wow, folks were enjoying to hear these around the, around the, around the fireplace. 
many of the poems in this little book were centered around the ski lodge itself. So there was no better place to read them. <clears throat> the ski guide climbs from Skokie Lodge and Shush Deception Pass, you know, the opening line of one poem, just as good as it gets. Um, and I spoke to Paul Pito, who was the manager at the lodge at the time, and he says, oh, yes, Jimmy's still living. You should stop in and see him in Banff. So 10 o'clock in the morning from the phone booth at the corner of the safe, Safeway parking lot, I introduced myself as the chore boy of Skokie Lodge. And he knows all about Skokie, having worked there as a teenager himself for Lizzie Rummel and others. And he says, come on over and I'll buy you a scotch, buy you a drink. And uh, so I visited he and his wife, Doreen, many times over a few years. He passed away in 1996. And uh, I recited a poem or two for him on those visits. And he says, well, that's the first time I've heard my poems recited. But he he really, it was great that this was put together and it was um, republished in 1994 by a colleague of mine in Parks Canada. So that was um, Skokie. And then my career with Parks Canada spanning 36 years and which mentions on the poster um, for the presentation tonight, shortening the trail miles at the end of the day, hiking along, reciting the trail poems, and perhaps a deterrent too to preventing surprising a bear, and uh, belting out these poems and perhaps a few by Robert Service that I'd put to memory. And yes, it never I never was interrupted by a bear. Must have worked. Uh, Jimmy Deegan was a parks man, born and raised in Banff. His long career with the outfit was so wonderfully articulated in his obituary written by Rick Cornelius and published in the Banff Craig and Canyon in January of 1996, following his passing. The, the uh, obit quotes many friends reflecting on Jim's life, including our very own Sid Marty, who you may have heard last week. And he expressed the sentiments uh, shared by many other wardens. And I'll quote Sid, and he said about Jim. When Timberline Jim was a warden service dispatcher, his mind rode on your back trail through the mountains he knew so well. He knew when you would be topping Dormer Pass and when you should be on saddling at Barrier Mountain. When he could travel no more, he sent his stories and poems about the living and the dead along with you to warm your cold October nights. He was singular, innocent without being foolish, full of foolery to our great joy, wise without pretension, so therefore generous. To know him was to know what hope and laughter can defeat and in the end console. Very nice words from Sid Marty about Jim Deegan. So here we go. We don't have the campfire ambience quite, <laughs> or the Skokie Ski Lodge campfire, but I'll start into it with a poem called Up the Creek. And uh, it captures the sentiments of the warden on patrol and despite certain hardships, how dedication to his work is unwavering. When you break trail up the 40 mile, and you reel and you curse and you sweat. You trip up in the willow brush and you get your snowshoes wet. You stagger up the side hill, wrestling with your rucksack. You holler to your sidekick. How gold darn far is that shack? Lord, I'm gonna pass out. Another mile, you say. Now I know why mountain men are prematurely gray. <laughs> you struggle through the dismal snows like an ancient clot. Any normal living person would think you had been shot. Your partner starts to babble, pointing o'er the hump, but you can't see a gosh darn thing, except maybe a stump. Oh, mystic shack, I see you now. I'm smiling like a goof. I'm grinning like a stud horse, because I'm standing on your roof. You heave with all your ebbing strength to open wide the door. I see by your feeble actions that you have been here before. To those poor men who snowshoe, to the terrain of Mystic Peak, to them, I take my hat off. 
because they're really up the creek. For it's up the trail and over logs through muskeg frozen flat, over hills and gullies, creeks and slides like a blasted wildcat. When temperatures drop to zero and the days grow short and dark and snowstorms are quite frequent out where the gray wolves bark, the warden is patrolling for illegal furs and game. The patrol of the 40 mile would put a superman to shame. Yet through the years, the sweat and the tears, I'll break the mystic trail. When the elk are starving, the bears are sleeping, and the blizzards howl and wail. Frosted lungs and numbing fingers, frozen toes and cheeks, an apparition from out of a glacier, amongst the forest, vale, peaks. You saw and you chop and you stagger and you flop and you pull the windfalls clear. Then the fearful moment, what in hell am I doing here? Porcupines and pack rats, cougars, lynx and bears, wolverines and muskrats, poachers with wire snares. But when the camp stove's red and cheery and a moose steak aroma nigh, then to hell with civilization, to all of its phony hue and cry, I'll stand up for the backcountry until the day I die by Jimmy Deegan. And that was written back in 1952. John White of Banff wrote about Jim in the books forward. And this was reprinted, yes, in 1994 in the revised edition by Cindy Smith. So I think you can still purchase the book at the White Museum and Archive Bookstore in Banff. But I'd just like to take a minute to, to read what <clears throat> John White wrote about Jim Deegan in this publisher's note. And Cindy Smith, Coyote Books in Canmore, re reprinted in her revision of the book. John said, there is a value in these tales that cannot be measured. Mountains have a way of making their inhabitants larger than life, and it is an unusual talent that can take the jagged outline of a life and shape it into verse, telling tales that reverberate with humor, poignancy, and a broad truth. Timberline Jim has the talent to translate his knowledge of what mountains do to people. I thought that was very nice. <clears throat> and then I'll go right into a 1954 poem by Jimmy Deegan called The Game Warden Lament. And how are we doing on Zoom? I hope everyone is still connected and able. And it says it's recording. So there we go for future pros prosperity on YouTube through the Pinch Library site my first experience with Zoom. There's a cabin on Divide Creek. Its logs are bleaching white. I've got to find that cabin this dark and stormy night. Left the Clearwater River this morning, bound for the shack on the red. High in the clouds, without warning, a blizzard came up with its dread. I see you, little cabin, half buried by the snows. It's shelter for a traveler, up where the north wind blows. Come swirling about my body, snarl and snap with glee, winds of 60 miles an hour with just half a mile to ski. Skiing down a head wall, miraculously missing trees, I smash into a windfall and I cripple both my knees. I see you, Divide Creek Cabin, so near yet far away. I'm crawling to your welcome door though hell shall bar the way. There's food in every cupboard. There's a cooking stove there too. There's wood and blankets plenty and half a moose to chew. Now the storm is fearful. It screams in an awful shriek. I give a cry of sheer delight as I reach the cabin on the creek. I contact Banff by telephone. 
I'll be at Scotch Camp in a day. There's six miles of downhill travel, but I'll get there come what may. I leave you, Divide Creek Cabin. I'm heading down the red. If I lingered in your shelter, I'd be frozen, stiff and dead. Stumbling down the cut banks, wallowing in ravines, cursing monks the solemn spruce, foundering along in streams. I've got to make the red deer, no matter what the cost. As in the words of Ted Christensen, he who hesitates is lost. I traverse the frozen river where Jimmy Simpson's horses range. I stagger into the cabin like a coyote with the mange. I enter the Red Deer River morgue. It's a corral with a roof overhead. Soon the fire is a-roaring and the stove is turning red. Bacon and beans for breakfast. I raise the government ranch on the phone. Can you come up and get me? I'm freezing and alone. The answer is ironic. I sneer and I sputter and I spit. The reply I heard on the telephone would give a corpse a fit. Now there are words of sympathy for people who live in the town. There are always priests and ministers when your spirit is run down. But sympathy from a ranch boss is a horse of another breed. So do not let your hair down to the master of the steed. These are the words that he told me at 50 degrees below, as the wolves sang out in a funeral choir and hunkered down in the snow. Now do this act before you freeze and let it be the final thing. Cross your arms and legs so you'll skid out behind a saddle horse in the spring <laughs> by Jim Deegan, yeah. written in 1954. <laughs> he certainly had a way with words has a way with words <clears throat> now more like Sid Marty's poems which are less rhyming um, in this poem written in 1956 at age 30 there is a phil 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 philosophical side to Jimmy Deegan. A mountain. A mountain is a cruel master. He stands in beckoning dignity, enticing mere mortals to his lofty heights, hypnotizing minds to try and conquer, entangling their souls with dreams of grandeur, flaunting himself before weak eyes. Once he's trapped you skyward, sucks out your breath, breaks your body, causing agony to human hearts, bringing tears to mortal eyes. If you escape unharmed and unafraid, he cares not. If you are his slave in fear or hatred, or if you love this mountain, beware, he cares nothing for you. A mountain is above, a selfish thing, unthinking, uncaring, and unconquerable. Jimmy Deegan. <clears throat> yes, indeed, enticing mere mortals to his lofty heights. In the book, two poems are themed around the skier and the avalanche. One where the illegal fur trapper is pursued by the warden through the mountains and eventually into the Lake O'Hara area. It isn't the warden who gets his man. The trapper succumbs to the deadly fury of winter in Yoho's Duchesne Pass. The other avalanche poem, which I'll recite for you, written by Jim's trail buddy, Dolomite John Porter, tells the story of the deadly white fury set again in Duchesne Pass and in the mountains around Skokie. It is the legend of the halfway hut. And here by the warm ambience of the campfire, I'll try and recreate Jimmy's ghost story. A little bit more background, the ghosts in the poems are Chris and Joe Dam. 
whose bright young lives and hopeful futures ended in February of 1933. Yes, on Duchesne Pass in Yoho Park. Theirs were the first recorded avalanche deaths in the Canadian Rockies. The Golden Star of June 30th, 1933, reported that the bodies were finally located. The Swiss guide Rudolf Amer and his partner Christian Hasler led the long and well-publicized search. The Dayams were just in their early their mid twenties, and their father was a prominent CPR employee. The family was well known from Revelstoke to Banff. And I worked in the field train station as an operator there, and a colleague of mine pulled out of the big oak desk drawer a weather ledger that was used by the yard master. And it detailed each day the progress of the search, the weather that they were challenged by. And it went right through to June of 1930 and 33 when their bodies were found. And that weather ledger is amongst other memorabilia and documentation about the search in the Revelstoke Museum. And I have a copy of it all. It's a terrific uh, little bit of Canadian Rocky story. There's four ghosts in this ghost story. The sec third I'll mention is Paley, the renowned mathematician. Raymond Edward Allen Christopher Paley. About six weeks after the Dam boys died, the Dam brothers, not far to the northeast, a guest of the brand new Skokie Ski Lodge, a guest of Peter and Catherine White in the newly opened lodge, he triggered an avalanche on Fossil Mountain visible from the front door of the lodge. A renowned mathematician, and if there's anyone in the audience that has a mathematical background, you may have heard of the Paley-Weiner theorem. Catherine, the hostess, and her husband Peter at the lodge were shook to the core, as you can imagine. She wrote letters daily to her mother in um, Concord, Massachusetts, I believe it was. These are all available online for all of us to read today. And the search, of course, for his for Paley's body, the death, of course, well covered. And the fourth ghost in the poem is the Austrian guide, Hermann Gadner. He died in an avalanche again, not far from Skokie, in the Richardson Bowl, just north of the Lake Louise ski area. And he was guiding a group of skiers from Austria. He, he, he was an Austrian guide guiding a group in the spring of 1945. And the old friend of mine, Ken Jones, who was on the recovery team, related the story to me personally. He, he recounted the story to me when we were at Skokie Lodge, just as if it happened yesterday. And on a, a side note, I'm going to mention, too, that Gadner's accidents and all three of these early day skiing tragedies are documented in the book Guardians of the Peaks, Mountain Rescue in the Canadian Rockies and the Columbia Mountains by my friends and former park wardens. Kathy Calvert and Dale Portman. It mentions all of the mountain rescue work of the of the park wardens over the years. Without further ado, now as promised to me that um, fan hasn't shut off, but I don't know how it sounds on Zoom, but it's sure noisy in my my right ear. Regardless, the Legend of the Halfway Hut by John Porter from Timberline Tales. A tale I must tell, though it's known full well to the men of the high country, to the intrepid skiers and bold mountaineers who roam the Ptarmigan Valley. It's the tale of a shack which lies far back in that country, rugged and wild, where no man can stay beyond light of day when the snow lies thickly piled. I must interject. This little ski hut that we're talking about was built halfway to Skokie Ski Lodge from the train station in Lake Louise as a shelter for the skiers. It still stands today. It's been restored by Parks Canada, but there is no stove in it. So I don't know what these boys are gonna do. <laughs> On a wintry night, if you see light from the halfway cabin gleam, pay no heed, but put on speed for it's not what it might seem. Or at other times when the blue smoke climbs from the rusty chimney stack, don't play with fate for you'll find too late that the stove lies cold and black. For this is the den of four strong men. Do I see your faces blanch? 
four good mountaineers who met with jeers, the threat of the avalanche. Two perished, alas, in the Duchesne Pass, the third in the Richardson Bowl, the fourth Mount Fossil retained, and all that remained on the snow was a bent ski pole. Yes, this was their fate, and as each reached the gate, and Gabriel wound on his horn, old Peter cried out with a mighty shout, Friend, don't look so forlorn. As a good mountaineer, you don't belong here. There isn't one hill to ski. So we're sending you back to the halfway shack for the rest of eternity. So back Gadner went, and Paley was sent soon after to join him there. Then after a spell, the two dam boys as well moved into the mountain lair. When these two appeared, Herman Gadner cheered as he poured them a nebulous rum. Now the number is right. We'll play poker tonight. By golly, lads, I'm glad that you've come. If you're skiing by day past the old halfway, you may think it an ordinary sight. For deserted it lies, but you'll rub your eyes if you travel that trail by night. Down from Tarmigan Peak with a terrible shriek and trailing vermilion flames on his fluorescent skis, Gadner roars through the trees, leading Paley and both of the dams. The wind from their shoosh bends the tops of the spruce and startles the snows from their height. Their yodels resound with a fantastic sound as they hurtle along through the night. To the halfway they come with their packs filled with rum. At the doorway they kick off their skis. Soon the fire is lit, round the table they sit, and there they relax at their ease. All the night long there are snatches of song and the clinking of glass upon glass while the poker chips click and the playing cards flick and phantasmal fortunes amass. But the first light of dawn sees the four specters gone. In a great whirl of snow they streak to their daytime repose in the sharp cornice snows on the summit of Ptarmigan Peak. Oh yes, there's a shaft which lies far back in that country rugged and wild where no man can stay beyond light of day when the snow lies thickly piled, which offers no rest to the skier hard pressed, no shelter against the storm. For this is the den of four strong men who now have no human form. Now the tale has been told, and I charge you to hold the words that I've told you as true. And though you may doubt what I've written about, there's one way to prove it to you. Just sleep there one night. If your hair is not white, when the sun tops the mountains next day, I'll agree to take back all I've told of the shack that's known as the Old Halfway by John Porter. John Porter worked for Parks, I do believe, on trails a little bit, but he also was in Banff on Tunnel Mountain, if I got that right, in the Cosmic Ray Station. A federal agency was running a Cosmic Ray Station, and it's still there today, I believe, as a National Historic Place. Now a few poems <clears throat> by the prolific writer, our own Sid Marty. Sid and his wife Myrna live just northwest of town on a beautiful sweep of the foothills there on the lower slopes of the Livingston Range. Park Warden himself spanning the years 62 to 78. In an interview with Pamela Banting recently published as an afterword in his latest book here that I'm holding up. <clears throat> um, he says, Sid says to Pamela Banting in this afterword, which is a wonderful part of the book, you almost should read it first. <laughs> um, Sid says, I somehow cobbled together a living as poet, prose writer, and musician full-time since 1978. 
His first nonfiction book, Men for the Mountains, published in 1978, was born out of his first book of poetry, Headwaters, from 1973, through encouragement from the publisher, Jack McClelland. Interesting how that developed. So they saw this wonderful collection of verse and said, tell us the story behind it. And he, hence in 1978, five years later, he writes Men for the Mountains. Four other nonfiction books since that first one. We all perhaps know Leaning on the Wind about this country here and Switchbacks, two of my favorites. And there's the Black Grizzly of Whiskey Creek and a wonderful history of the, um, the Parks, Parks Canada, the National Park Service um, that was commissioned by Parks, I do believe, and published for the 100th anniversary, 1985. I've been a fan of SIDS ever since first reading Men for the Mountains when it was hot off the press. And hats off to you, Sid, if you're listening. I don't know if you are, but you were here last night and folks can pass it on to Sid. But we appreciate his writing and his song. Writing the mountain culture, as, as he says himself, using a Western mountain vernacular, that voice and the story that so many, like myself, know so well and can relate to. So thank you, Sid, for, for all these great, great poems. And I remember first time I met him was 78, 1978, outside the Post Hotel where I was working. And he was there with his strumming his guitar with several others, big bonfire, kind of a winter event right on the main street by Rockets Shell Gas Station, I think it was, at the Post Hotel. And um, yeah, so amazing man and what he has put together. But I'll read several from this tonight and get my notes back and um, and I'll flip over to um, inside the map on page 41 and it speaks of the, the warden's work along the trail. And he writes this for Bob Haney, our warden in Banff. There is a trail into those ranges, its continuity more mapped than real Constantly, its aim is cut by swollen creeks of runoff, burdened by snow slides. It sags downhill. The bare metal phone line is lost in a tangle of trees and mud. The voice fades, shorted through stones, filtered through roots. The twisted line breaks down. The warden there in spring must cut his way out, then cut his way back in, slashing away half-thawed debris, swimming his horses through lonely streams, salvaging broken packs in the muck. Wet as a muskrat, he rolls a smoke, thinking to strike the trail on the rock slide, tightening a cinch, longing for fire, his chilled gut churns for hot coffee lashed with strong rum. 10 miles, 20 miles, Jacques Lake, Grizzly Shelter, Rocky Forks, and Mend Corral. Next, shoe horses in the gumbo. Now you've earned your fire. Timber wolves howl up the valley under Mount Valcars. On page 97, I'll read Sid's poem, The Argument for Ascending. And I say to myself today, stick to the trails, you stiff-kneed old goat. Side hill gouging gives your ankles pain. Stiff-kneed evenings and arthritic old age. Slab rock and ice have let so many down from an awkward balance to their finger ends. 
the mystery of falling. Gravity too is my domain. It turns you swimmer over. I watch from the steep approaches. Would you be the man for the mountain? The skulls of goats, the skulls of sheep, foot my precipitous fences. Learn to fail sometimes, bear with me. Your body is the cross you carry up to the high places. And your reward, a tearing wind, a view of endless higher mountains. The blaze. The blaze, as we're hiking along the trail and the old spruce tree, you see the chop of an ax that is the, the marker as we make our way along. So in this poem, Sid is on, has composed it in his head on horseback as he's traveling up, up the trail. The scar on the pine tree is choked with pitch, the hairs of a bear that brushed by with crystals of heavy dew stuck there. This wound that is my guide is nearly healed, marks the journey begun by other men, isolated on lonely missions. Over the years, each made his mark, his mark as I do now. Some got lost in the green offing, whose loss added to our knowledge. We who remain to continue the journey. Laura, this creek is called for one of their women. Happy, unhappy name, we know not. There is no record. The route not famed enough for history, not new enough for memory, is but a weave in a canyon. We who continue maintain our own winding stories in this name. The south boundary of Jasper is a, a place I have not visited. It is a beautiful place, I understand, from the trail guide and from, from uh, reading other about this area of Jasper Park. And here is Sid describing for us in this poem, riding out of Rocky Forks country. So just his muse as he travels along on horseback through the day. 10 days on the boundary, the black mare's knees swell up, erupt in yellow pus. So it's decided to bring her out through Karen Pass, down the river, the medicine tent. From the outpost, Grizzly shelter, a trail runs through willow, through alder, by the river and rich soap berries. Good bear food grow there. Road, singing in a light rain. There was bear shit full of red berries, track of the little stocky brown, three or four years old, wears a cinnamon mantle on his thick set shoulders, range in the valleys, He's wild, disdaining the highway. He combs the side hill, strong as a young spruce, fat with pounds of wintering lard. These scats are fresh. The tracks ooze water as he prowls ahead of me. And once he barks beside me somewhere in a dogwood thicket, the horse's ears swivel trained on him like radar cones. Keep moving, little brother, I say to let him know who's coming. It is he 
I smell his rank musk, and he knows my voice of old. Don't mess with me, I warn him. This black mare kicks like thunder. Poor little bear, and with my axe, I'd split your skull should you choose to close this distance. Clearly we have you outnumbered, I tell him, and I know. There is no fear to smell on me. Ten days horse sweat and stiff jeans that stand up by themselves. So I keep on singing, though. Little brother offers no trouble. His presence makes me cunning, cold with a cold rain and quick moving. I will sing my song for him and this weather. Brother, we will travel together, deadheading down, unseen to each other as you lead me to the road. Brother, we will sound each other when the wind shifts. We shall be certain of one another, Brother Bear. And I'll finish Sid's poems here with Abbott. And I'll pick up the old copy of um, fading old pages. I don't know where I happened on this copy of this particular book, Headwaters, but being published in 1973, that was the first year and el the elder in our family came to the mountains from Prince Edward Island. And it may well have been that she directed me towards this great book of poetry eventually that I um, have been so fond of and which is reprinted in, in the new and collected poems book, Old Man's River. <clears throat> so an introduction to Sid's poem, Abbott, 28 year old Philip Stanley Abbott a Harvard grad, a lawyer. His love of the trail and the uncaring mountains indeed dies in 1896 on the first attempt of Mount Lefroy in the newly created Banff Park above his now namesake pass, Abbott Pass. Visible from the plain of Six Glaciers Trail that starts by the Chateau Le Louise. Abbott had climbed the Matterhorn and the Weishorn, according to Wikipedia, his death became the first recorded mountaineering fatality in North America. A year ago, that area was in the news often, surrounding the mountain hut that had to be removed for safety reasons. Abbott Hut no more. So here by Sid Marty, Abbott. So they've named a pass for me and built a hut there. Well, why not? I died well. I fell off a mountain, the first attempt on Mount Lefroy. I was going to see new places, to foot the ridgepole of the continent, off balanced, I guess, by the completely indifferent climate, that kind of clearness in the air makes men dizzy. Others have fallen since. Dead men have been left in Abbott's hut for safekeeping overnight. Like the one Furman, the guide, offered tea to. Arriving in the night, he thought the bunk rooms must be full, and this sound sleeper on the kitchen floor had no bed bundled in his sleeping bag. But there's many stories of that place. Men fall off mountains because they have no business being there. That's why they go. That's why they die. Great little poem. <clears throat> Thank you, Sid. Now, Robert Service. Everyone has heard of Robert Service. And I have numerous, some books from the early 1900s. And even in the early 1900s, it was like the 13th edition. He was a poet 
that made good right off the the bat. And that is a very that is a very interesting story. <clears throat> if you are interested in Robert Service, where's the camera? Enid Mallory wrote this biography. Enid Mallory. And it's called Under the Spell of the Yukon. It is without a doubt terrific. And I'm going to introduce my few poems by Robert Service by reading what she says about him in the back. For those of you that just need the review, all of us. In 1907, a shy bank clerk sent a collection of his poems south from the Yukon to be privately published and shared with a small group of friends. Fate intervened, however, and Robert Service became a household name across North America and throughout the British Commonwealth. Words were Service's lifelong passion, and he set them on many stages. But it was his Dan McGrew, Sam McGee, and other players of the Great White North who glittered with a golden glow and forever made him the bard of the Yukon and the de facto poet laureate of Alaska. His cabin, where he wrote many of the poems in um, Dawson, is a, a National Historic Site. And I have this great little Environment Canada and Park Service, Robert Service uh, brochure. And, and there's his little cabin that I visited up in Dawson. It's a National Historic Site. It's a, it's a great little summary, this brochure. Tuck away back in my book. <clears throat> and I'm going to flip to page 262 in this great um, collected poems of Robert Service. I have, I have almost all of these in little individual books, first publication type of thing. I just, I love his poems and, and often will recite them as I'm tromping along the trail. I do have them put to memory but I wouldn't dare to do it with the distractions of Zoom, the fan, the audience. <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll give you, I'm scared of it all. I'm scared of it all. God's truth, so I am. It's too big and brutal for me. My nerves on the raw and I don't give a damn for all the hurrah that I see. I'm pinned between subway and overhead train where automobiles swoop down. Oh, I want to go back to the timber again. I'm scared of the terrible town. I want to go back to my lean ashen plains, my rivers that flash into foam, my ultimate valleys where solitude reigns, my trail from Fort Churchill to Nome, my forests packed full of mysterious gloom, my ice fields a grind in the glare. The city is deadfalled with danger and doom. I know that I'm safer up there. I watch the wan faces that flash in the street, all kinds and all classes I see, yet never a one in the million I meet has the smile of a comrade for me. Just jaded and panting like dogs in a pack, just tensed and intent on the goal. Oh God, but I'm lonesome. I wish I was back up there in the land of the pole. I wish I was back on the hunger plateaus and seeking the lost caribou. I wish I was up where the copper mine flows to the kick of my little canoe. I'd like to be far on some weariful shore in the land of the blizzard and bear. Oh, I wish I was snug in the Arctic once more, for I know I am safer up there. I prowl in the canyons of dismal unrest. I cringe, I'm so weak and so small. I can't get my bearings, I'm crushed and oppressed with the haste and the waste of it all. The slaves and the madmen, the lust and the sweat, the fear in the faces I see, the getting, the spending, the fever, the fret, it's too bleeding cruel for me. I feel it's all wrong, but I can't tell you why. The palace and the hovel next door, the insolent towers that sprawl to the sky, 
the crush and the rush and the roar. I'm trapped like a fox and I fear for my pelt. I cower in the crash and the glare. Oh, I want to be back in the avalanche belt for I know that it's safer up there. I'm scared of it all, oh, afar I can hear the voice of my solitude's call, where nothing but brute with a little veneer and nature is best after all. There's tumult and terror and abroad in the street. There's menace and doom in the air. I've got to get back to my thousand mile beat, the trail where the cougar and silver tip meet, the snows in the campfire with wolves at my feet. Goodbye for it's safer up there. To be forming good habits up there, to be starving on rabbits up there, in your hunger and woe, though it's 60 below, oh, I know that it's safer up there. The Lone Trail. Yes, Samantha invited me to the library here tonight and she said, Edwin, whatever you like on the theme of trails. And last week it was Sid Marty himself playing and reciting his poems. And the week before that, it was Stephen Hawley from Pincher Creek here with Adaptable Outdoors. And Stephen two weeks ago spoke about he how he and his team largely made up of volunteers with grant money and such will take people with disabilities to the mountaintop. And they go out into Beauvais Park often, they go down to Waterton. It's on a wheeled um, stretcher, we could kind of say the analogy, um, a team of four, five, six or more, and taking you up the mountain trail or taking you out in the canoe or kayaking. And I just think it's an, a, a wonderful thing. So if you're um, local and you're interested adaptable outdoors by Stephen Hawley and of course he's following the the model of many from around um, the world who are providing for people with disabilities and making sure that they too can get out into nature and on the trail it's a great thing by Robert Service the Lone Trail ye who know the Lone Trail fain would follow it Though it lead to glory or the darkness of the pit, ye who take the lone trail, build, bid your love goodbye. The lone trail, the lone trail, follow till you die. The trails of the world be countless, and most of the trails be tried. You tread on the heels of the many till you come where the ways divide. And one lies safe in the sunlight, the other is dreary and wan. Yet you look aslant at the lone trail, and the lone trail lures you on. And somehow you're sick of the highway with its noise and its easy needs. And you seek the risk of the byway and you reek not where it leads. And sometimes it leads to the desert and the tongue swells out of your mouth and you stagger blind to the mirage to die in the mocking drought. Sometimes it leads to the mountain, to the light of the lone campfire and you gnaw your belt in the anguish of hunger goaded desire. Sometimes it leads to the Southland, to the swamp where the orchid glows, and you rave to your grave with the fever, and they rob the corpse for its clothes. Sometimes it leads to the Northland, and the scurvy softens your bones, and your flesh dints in like putty, and you spit out your teeth like stones. Sometimes it leads to a coral reef, in the wash of a weedy sea, and you sit and stare at the empty glare where the gulls wait greedily. Sometimes it leads to an Arctic trail and the snows where, where your torn feet freeze, and you whittle away the useless clay and crawl in your hands and knees. Often it leads to the dead pit, always it leads to pain. By the bones of your brothers ye you know it, but oh, to follow your fame. By your bones they will follow behind you till the ways of the world are made plain. Bid goodbye to sweetheart. Bid goodbye to friend. The lone trail, the lone trail. Follow to the end. Tarry not and fear not. 
chosen of the true, lover of the lone trail. The lone trail waits for you. You'd learn in, in uh, this biography of Robert Service about the young in Englishman who lived in Scotland a while, comes across the Atlantic Ocean, jumps on the train straight to the Canadian West and works for a little while on the, the dairy farm of his relatives on Vancouver Island. And then sort of six years becomes the hobo's life down through California, even into Baja California, through the deserts of the Southwest, um, country that I love and have, have visited over the years. But then he's back to um, to Victoria and applies with the, the bank again. He had worked as a banker for a little bit, a clerk in the bank. And lo and behold, CIBC sends him, the Bank of Commerce sends him up to, um, to the uh, Northland where he mostly learns of the story of the gold rush after the fact, but from many who still were in the area. And he visited the, the, the local pubs frequently, but he never took a drink. He was a teetotaler his whole life. Anyway, published, yes, his first poems, became rich on that. And um, the island of Majorca, I believe it is, in the Mediterranean, he, um, and he lived his life, married a Parisian woman. Um, uh, the First World War, yes, he worked as a Red Cross man the First World War, driving an ambulance and helping with the, uh, and he wrote a beautiful book of poems called Rhymes of a Red Cross Man um, that are all in the collected poems, but just a remarkable character. And um, I'll read one more here, The Heart of the Sourdough. And uh, one of his, Robert Service's great, greater bo greatest books I like is called Why Not Grow Young? And it's about uh, fighting aging. And uh, oh my, it is the most interesting self-help book that was published in, uh, I think it was the 1930s, uh, around the, before the war, I believe. But Why Not Grow Young by Robert Service. It's not quite the title, but close. The Heart of the Sourdough. There where the mighty mountains bear their fangs unto the moon. There where the sullen sun dogs glare in the snow bright bitter noon. And the glacier glutted streams sweep down at the clarion call of June. There where the livid tundras keep their triest with the tranquil snows. There where the silences are spawned and the light of hellfire flows into the bowl of the midnight sky, violet, amber, and rose. There where the rapids churn and roar and the ice flows bellowing run, where the tortured twisted rivers of blood rush to the setting sun, I've packed my kit and I'm going, boys, ere another day is done. I knew it would call or soon or late as it calls the whirring wings. It's the olden lure, it's the golden lure, it's the lure of the timeless things. And tonight, O oh God of the trails untrod, how it winds in my heart's strings. I'm sick to death if you're well-groomed gods, your make-believe in your show. I long for a whiff of bacon and beans, a snug shake down in the snow, a trail to break and a life at stake and another bout with the foe. With the raw ribbed wild that abhors all life, the wild that would crush and rend, I have clinched and closed with the naked north. I have learned to defy and defend. Shoulder to shoulder we have fought it out, yet the wild must win in the end. I have flouted the wild, I have followed its lure, fearless, familiar, alone. By all that the battle means and makes, I claim that land for mine own. Yet the wild must win, and a day will come when I shall be overthrown. Then when as wolf dogs fight, we've fought that lean wolf land and die, fought and bled till the snows are red under the reeling sky, even as lean wolf dog goes down, will I go down and die. By Robert Service, <clears throat> The Heart of the Sourdough.
And I'm going to glance up here at the time, and it's almost time to finish up, Edwin. I'm going to finish with, with another of Jimmy Deegan's poems. <clears throat> the Castle Guard Plateaus. And it's very interesting. This was written when Jimmy was 23 years old. 1949. And Upon my death, my soul I pray. Um, my soul I pray is his second last verse. He wanted to remain there in spirit forever and ever. And on on January the fifth, on August the twenty second of nineteen ninety six, just months after he passed away, two of his colleagues in the Park Service, Keith Everts and Donnie Mickle, they did scatter Jim's ashes in the ca Castle Guard. Plateau. So here's the young 23 year old, 1949, writing this. <clears throat> High above the tumult of a maddened civilization, in a terrain where godliness abounds, amongst pinnacle summits whose gray walls have withstood an eternity of abuse from nature's harshest storms, stands a high frontier of iced ravines and alpine desolation. Plateaus of my homeland, of which I always dream. Alone stands this silent barrier where humans seldom tread. The glacier sullen, its blue glaring depths could unfold from its embrace an incredible mystery of prehistoric life, mammals of the bygone ages entombed within the creaking ice. Up on the heaved moraine I climb, my ice axe probing the unsound, infirm heap beneath me, gingerly stepping delicate snow bridges on trickeny nailed boots with apprehension I move on to the ice, up towards a crested summit. I skirt a wide crevasse which leers and into which a gurgling stream snakes downward into the abyss. Suddenly, I am on the roof of the world, I gaze at an expanse of ice fields as far as the horizon, summits of foreboding rock. Skittering clouds grope around me and the booming of avalanches rolls hollowly. The chill wind shrieks and clutches at my frayed parka. I find shelter behind a rock slab, pipe alight, gaze at this ocean of ever moving ice. Then it's down the Western divide leaping crevices to land in banks of snow. To my left, I behold green tundra, chundras. Cautiously, I jump the bergschund and land knee deep in talus. I climb to a ridge and survey my surroundings. The shriek of a marmot betrays my presence as I intrude the hushed castle guard plateaus. Staggered by the incomparable beauty around me, I hike to a pass on a carpet of alpine flowers. I observe a frontier of ice fields, dark green lush tundra alive with caribou, vapor rising from myriads of springs, princely mountains rising in an unbroken line from south to north, their peaks thrust into the blue, while before me, arrowed into the heavens, stands Castle Guard Peak. Mount Castleguard, sparkling in sunshine, eternal snow clinging its parapets, sheer walls glittering with ice, avalanches peeling from its rock towers, bastions thrust into the heavens, stands guarding its paradise. A massive silver tip rears his muscle dun colored body from a clump of fur, scents the wind with nostrils expanded, Beady eyes peering toward the danger, nape hair bristling, saliva drooling from cavernous jaws, hooked claws red with gore, humped over his kill, master of his high wilderness. I look upwards to the mountains whose heights have taken my heart. I gaze at this land, and a thought enters my mind, which today is foremost in my memory. It is here I am destined to live, amidst the storms and wildlife. And to my final hope, 
This is the land where I hope to die. Upon my death, my soul, I pray, shall range from crag to crag, from turquoise lakes and on to wide meadows, where the bugling of antlered monarchs shall call the wild. In the high reaches of the Rockies, you may find me, until the Creator calls each to his reward in the Castle Guard, Steps to Infinity, by Jim Deegan. And there his spirit remains. Thank you all. I took up an hour plus. <laughs> And yes, we had uh, my cousin from Toronto and my niece was there in New Zealand, Diane Forbes and, and our host. Any questions from the audience? There's folks waving, my niece and my sister. who <laughs> introduced me to Skokie. <laughs> That's great. I guess there's no questions from the chat. Turn on your video if you have one. Doesn't say anything about questions, does it, Sam? No, no, it would be the, yeah. uh, here, like, We'll just say thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah, great, wonderful to think that you're down there in the afternoon tomorrow in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for hosting. Uh, oh, here, let's see. Oh, I don't know what I'm We're doing. good. We're good. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience here? Any questions? <clears throat> yes. In Akma's at Robert Service uh, cabin. No, I, I must have been there in the off season and I did not catch that at all. Right. Yep. <clears throat> yes. I look forward to that. I'm going to I'm going to definitely go up to the Yukon on that trip. It would be great. Yeah. To see that cabin and to see the parks person who's employed to recite Robert Service's poems and <laughs> perhaps there's a retirement career for me. All right. We'll end the uh end the uh program. Thank you. Good night. I want you to say thank you to